if you have a harbour wall and waves are coming in on it and I'm just going to draw my wave fronts from top down if they're moving towards there then the wall's going to stop a lot of the wave fronts but when they go through the waves don't just carry on as little waves here but no they're going to spread out like that that's what we call diffraction when waves go through a gap or around an object they diffract they will fill in the empty space where the waves aren't they will spread out now we see this with sea waves but we also see this with light and em waves and it's actually one of the main pieces of evidence for the wave nature of light first person to do this was a chap called young great physicist great scientist and he came up with a double slit setup what he did was get a candle which sent light towards a single slit. What happened when the light went through the slit? Of course, it diffracted like so. And then he had another two slits. These are Young's double slits right here. Why did he send the light through a single slit first? Well, he wanted monochromatic coherent light to be coming out of these two slits here. What does monochromatic mean? Mono, one chromatic, color, one color, or one wavelength. He wanted it to be coherent as well. Coherent also has this extra qualifier, which is constant phase difference. Now, you might say that just means in phase. The light getting to these two points, these two slits is in phase, but when the exams ask, what does coherent mean? They like this monochromatic and constant phase difference definition, not just in phase. So what happens when light diffracts longer wavelength, light diffracts more. Shorter wavelength, light diffracts less. So in this case, it would have been blue light that ended up coming from these two slits that Young had set up, therefore making sure that there was only one wavelength coming out of there. Nowadays, we don't actually need this single slit because we have lasers. Lasers produce monochromatic coherent light, so we just bash that straight into our double slit and we get the same effect. Generally, we use red light, reddish light. So the difference between young setup and our setup nowadays is the only difference is that he used a single slit to produce coherent light sources and we use a laser and a double slit. From then on, the whole experiment is exactly the same. Here we have our screen. Now if I was to draw this screen in three dimensions, it would look something like this, like that. What do we see? Instead of just two spots being produced on this screen, in fact, we see a whole band of fringes made on our screen. Why is that? Well, that's because we have interference going on. We have superpositioning. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Here's our screen here. And here's our double slits. Now I'm going to draw light rays in different colors here, but that's just to show you the different light rays, but they should all be monochromatic in reality. So let's have a look at the waves that meet right at the center. We have a wave coming from this top slit here, and we have a wave coming from the bottom slit here. Now these have traveled the same distance we have just a normal isosceles triangle. So in other words, we can say the path difference is zero. That just means that they've traveled the same distance. Now if they've traveled the same distance, 
the waves arrived at the double slits in phase and they left the double slits in phase and if they travel the same distance at the same speed then they've arrived at the screen in phase as well so i'm just drawing what they arrived at the screen like if they superimpose we get we've just got constructive interference But they're not the only two waves leaving these two slits, are they? What about the waves that end up going to here? Now, obviously the ray coming from the bottom slit has traveled further than the ray coming from the top slit. So we do actually have a path difference this time. But what is that path difference equals to? Well, if I take my ruler and I measure, that's 210, 210 on here, I can see that if I took this ray and put it onto this path here, it only comes to here. So if I draw a line there, this bit here is my path difference. That's how much further this ray has traveled compared to this ray. And all I've done is made a right angle triangle there. If we call this S, the slit separation, that's the uh, distance between the center of both of the slits. So from here to here. And I know that this distance here is, I'm gonna call that big D. So capital D, that's the distance from the slits to the screen. And I have my width here between one bright fringe that's in the center because we have constructive interference there and my next bright fringe which also must mean that these waves are arriving in phase and constructively interfering as well then using some clever trigonometry you don't really need to know the derivation for this we come up with Young's double slit equation that is W equals lambda D over s this is a slight approximation so it doesn't work perfectly it gets less and less accurate the further away from the screen you get because it assumes that we have a curved screen when in fact we actually don't we have a flat screen now the only way that this can be true is if the path difference here is exactly the same as the wavelength of the light so if this ray has traveled one wavelength further than this ray, that means that it's still going to arrive in phase. So that's why we get a bright fringe there as well. So we have a bright fringe here, I have a bright fringe here. What's going on in between when we have a dark fringe? Does that mean there's no light hitting that point on the screen? No, of course not, because there's light hitting all points on the screen here. So what is happening in reality is that we have this ray and this ray and this time the path difference is half a wavelength what does that mean it means that the waves actually arrive pi radians or 180 degrees out of phase they don't constructively interfere, they destructively interfere. They cancel each other out and we end up with a dark spot. So light is reaching that point on the screen, but when the waves superimpose, no light is reflected off the screen. Quite trippy, but that's what happens. So if the path difference is a multiple of the wavelength, one lambda, two lambda, three lambda, four lambda, in other words, if one of the rays travels a multiple of the wavelength further to get to the point on the screen than the other ray, then you end up with constructive interference because the rays arrive in phase. If the path difference, however, is a multiple and a half of the wavelength, then that means that the waves are going to arrive out of phase, pi radians 180 degrees out of phase. So that means that you end up with constructive. That means that you end up with destructive interference so that's when you get a dark fringe. Constructive interference, you end up with a bright fringe. Dark fringes are because of destructive interference. When you're measuring these experimentally, it's very difficult just to measure one fringe. So what you do is measure at least 10 fringes using the dark fringes because they're much easier to see. 
and then divide by 10 to find the mean fringe width. It's worth making sure that you understand how all of these things relate to each other. As W is inversely proportional to S, if lambda and D stay the same, that means that if S doubles, W halves, and vice versa as well. Also, we have W is proportional to D, if lambda and S stay the same. So that means that if D doubles, the fringe width has to double as well. One aside regarding this, If we draw what the interference pattern looks like for the double slit, we see this happening. Each fringe width is the same size and the intensity of the fringes drops off fairly slowly. However, we do actually get interference from diffraction from a single slit as well. All you need to know is that the interference pattern changes thusly. In this case, with a single slit, central max, it's a central bright fringe, the central maximum. Central maximum is very intense, very bright, compared to the other fringes. And also, it is double the width of the fringes too. So that's all you need to know about the single slit is how the interference pattern differs from the double slit. So how is a diffraction grating different to Young's double slit? Instead of just having two slits like that, instead we got loads and loads of slits that are very, very small and we get lots and lots of diffraction happening when light passes through that and diffracts afterwards diffracts as it goes through. This is where we can't use Young's double slit equation. We actually have to use a new equation. Now it's sort of interchangeable and it's a more accurate version of Young's double slit equation. But uh, we use Young's double slit equation for the double slit and we use this equation for the diffraction grating. So let's say we have our laser there and it's firing light towards a diffraction grating like so. And there's our screen. We actually get so much diffraction in this case that we end up with very visible orders. So one, two, three. Might get a few more like that. Now technically I should draw this with a curved screen because we are going to be dealing with angles instead of fringe width in this case. That's why we can't use doubles, Young's double slit equation. The order, the bright fringe that we get on the screen at the center, the central maximum, we call that the zeroth order. Going outwards, we call them the first order, first order the other side as well, second order, and so on and so forth. And the equation that we have is n lambda equals d sine theta. Theta being the angle between the central zeroth order and that order, we might be looking at the first one, we might be looking at the second one or the third. So this is our angle. D is our slit width in our grating. N is the order that we're looking at. And obviously lambda is our wavelength still. Now, one of the problems is, is that the size of D in this case is so small that it's not really that helpful to write it on our diffraction grating. Sometimes you'll be given big D instead. Now, this is where you have to be really, really careful because big D is not 
the distance. D for grating. It is lines per, usually per millimeter. So let's say that we have a grating that gives us 100 lines per millimeter. We don't want lines per millimeter, we just wanna know how big one of these lines is. What do we do to find little d? We just take the reciprocal. So that's gonna give us one over 100. So that's gonna give us 0 0.01 millimeters. Bear in mind that whatever it says lines per whatever unit, that's how big the measurement is gonna be for your slit width, your slit separation for your grating as well. You obviously need to turn that into standard form, into meters. So it's going to be at the minute minus one times 10 to the minus two millimeters. So it's gonna be one times 10 to the minus five meters. So you always, always need to turn it into meters in order to use it in the equation here. I can tell you the angle of the second order. So I'm gonna put theta two is actually 50 degrees. Because that's my second order, if I'm trying to find out the wavelength here, I'm gonna do lambda equals d sine theta divided by n. That's going to be our separation there, one times 10 to the minus five times the sine of 50 degrees, make sure you are in degrees, not radians, and then divide that by two because that is the second order. I'm looking at this 50 degrees right here. That's what I'm looking at, same up there. That gives you a wavelength of three point three times 10 to the minus six meters. Now you could be instead be asked to find out the angle at which an order is at. So in that case, you would have to do the inverse sine of N lambda over D. Ask this. What is the maximum number of orders that you can make? So I need to go straight for sine 90, because I'm looking at 90 degrees. I wanna find out what N is at 90 degrees. So I'm gonna find N at 90 degrees. So I'm trying to find out N equals D sine theta over lambda. So that's going to be D sine 90 over lambda but you might have noticed that we have sine 90 in there, which is equals to one. So that just disappears. So we end up with just D over lambda. Popping that in, I end up with one times 10 to the minus five divided by the wavelength that I calculated earlier. Oh, what do you know? That gives me 2.6. So N is 2.6. So uh, my, my diagram isn't very accurate here, but that's okay. So that means that I can make my zeroth order, first order, second order, but, but when I get to 90 degrees, I've hit 2.6th order. Obviously that doesn't exist. The third order is gonna be past 90 degrees. So in fact, I can't make 2.6 at all. So I go to the next number down, it's two. Even if this number was 2.9999999, that means that you cannot make that third order. So you have to go back down to two. So there you go. That's interference in a nutshell single slit, double slit, and diffraction, grating diffraction. If you think I've missed anything out, or if you've got any questions, then please put them in the comments below, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Bye for now.